Welcome to the first volcano track on our list. This should give you an idea of how highly I rate the environment as a whole. Underground Tour manages to be the worst, however, because unlike the other four tracks here, it lacks visual impact and the driving experience also cannot compare to its peers. It's still pretty alright though. The location of the start is a bit nondescript, almost random in its placement. We're not left to dwell on this for very long, as Underground Tour plays its hand within the first 10 seconds of the lap. A massive helter-skelter of a turn, which does a great job at informing you just how the rest of the track is going to go. Corners lunge at you like vicious beasts, and you get the unsavoury task of wrangling them. And don't think you can mend your halt in between them either, as the elevation changes so much and so drastically that you'll be scraping the floor no matter what you do. The only real reprieve you get is straight after the pipe, a straight jump with an easy landing, just begging for you to let loose of the turbo. The track remains straight, even as it goes straight vertical, and further erodes what little identity Sinta had in the process, letting you get comfortable with the increase in speed before taking it all away from you with a devilish left-hander. With the way the track elevation changes, this is, curiously, a corner you can see well in advance, but by the time you need to manoeuvre your craft, it's basically blind. One you have to trust with your feelings, rather than what you see. The corner afterwards is the final one, and is a nice little capstone to this hectic track. You come at it from above, and past the apex of this corner it begins to slope downwards, giving you an extra little nudge on your way to the finish. Boosting into that slope at the end of a hot lap is a simple pleasure, each and every time. To conclude then, Underground Tour is a rough and ragged track, but just falls on the side of being endearing rather than aggravating. It's decent for both time attack and racing, but is overshadowed by the other tracks in this environment through little fault of its own. Roaring Waters feels about as unassuming as Cinta, at least for the wider lens of the Red Out community as a whole. It doesn't get talked about much, let alone played, either through online races or time trials, and I think that's a shame, because it's a fun little track. No, Sarah actually being good here has nothing to do with it, what are you talking about? You know you're in Sequoia when the first turn is a hairpin. Roaring Waters certainly has its fair share of challenging corners, but there's also a surprising amount of straightaways here, unlike, say, Serpent, where it's just one corner after another. This doesn't diminish the difficulty of this track, but rather, it offers some breathing room between those tricky sections. It might be a larger part of the track's appeal than I give it credit for, because the likes of Serpent just become exhausting after a while. That's not to say the breathing room you do get isn't earned. Roaring Waters comes at you like an assault course, with a combination of corners that are quite unlike anything else in the roster. I'm particularly keen in this double apex corner, it feels like something out of a far more conventional racing game, but the floaty handling of Red Out ships recontextualises it completely. What follows after is a daring straightaway, with a kink halfway down the road obscured from vision. Oh, Red Out, you and your blind corners. Getting into a rhythm of where to place your ship isn't too hard at least, but is demanding enough to elicit joy every time you thread that needle. The track very kindly lets you bask in that for a moment as we speed under its set piece, a big ol' waterfall. The track gradually turns to the left, which like the first half of the lap promotes some delicate steering work before going off the rails one final time. Enjoy it while it lasts too, because if Roaring Waters is known for anything, it's the final hairpin, which sits up there with Annapurna and Kamsim in its sheer deviousness. In terms of tightness? No. The only reason it's such a bastard is because of the turn right before it. Good luck trying to get set up for the hairpin when there's a corner flinging you in the opposite direction. On one hand, I absolutely hate this corner for the amount of speed it shears off, but on the other hand, I like it because it's one of those rare places where using the brakes is justified, since it helps her take the ship in a hurry. Were it not for the dynamism of the rest of the track, this would feel pretty out of place, so I guess it fits but it's still my least favourite part of the whole track. One singular downside isn't too shabby, mind you, but like Shallow Waters, its upsides aren't exactly electrifying either. I still highly recommend it though, just for that first half of the lap. So good.
few tracks in the calendar have ever drawn out such intense feelings of ambivalence from me as Trench. If you asked me to rank it 3 months ago, it would be in a different spot to this. And if you'd asked me 6 months prior, its placement then would be completely different from the first two. So why do I flip flop in this track so much? Well, firstly, I just want to reaffirm that we are well and truly out of the realm of mediocrity here. Before giving you total whiplash by saying Trench frustrates the hell out of me. I think that's something important to note here going forward actually. Tracks that are good, or even great, can still nettle me from time to time because at the end of the day, Redout is a game of considerable mechanical depth. The tracks do well to highlight this, so it's not exactly a game you can just pick up and dive in whenever. It requires a certain mindset. And Trench emphasises this. It's got a few diverse elements at play here, from corner curtain, to loops, to pipes, oh god. They're strung together in a way that there's a little stopgap between each of them, letting you prepare for the next one. With how different they are from each other, that moment of preparation is needed, particularly for the trickiest part, the pipe. <sighs> Here we go again, huh? Unlike its infamous brother, however, Trench has plenty going for it that makes me want to improve and get better at the section. And I have. Well, I don't crash at least. My well-practiced technique goes something like this. Hey, it works. Despite my displeasure at having to go through the pipe section, it's the entrance into it that is actually my favourite part of the whole track. The loop's too steep to boost on, you just scrape your health and speed away in the floor, so you want to use it as soon as you're free of it. The road bends slightly as well, so entry into the pipe is trickier than it looks. Too little steering, and you're going to clip the wall on the outside and lose all the speed you need. Too much steering, and you're going to do that anyway. When you get it right, oh baby can you feel a difference. It also makes the rest of the pipe that much harder, but hey, double the trouble, double the satisfaction when you get it all right, right? That's how it goes. Totally. The last section of the track has you cut in lines with fine margins for error. But honestly, it's a reprieve after the pipe section, and I don't have too much to say on it other than getting it right is drastic for the health of your hot lap. A fair few people love Trench, and I can see why, but I just can't join them. I respect it and what it has to offer, but I can't love it. Part of me wants to proportion blame towards the pipe for this, but I don't think I can in good faith. It's just a tricky track from start to finish, and too many times I've come into it with the intent to just have a few laps and move on, rather than giving myself and the track the time it needs to get adjusted. Just before we move on, I'd like to leave you with this little tidbit, because I have no idea where else to put it in the script. This is the track where I got my first online victory, because the leader crashed out on the pipe section on the final lap. Also, I was in a soul half too. Now if that doesn't epitomise my mixed feelings on this track, I don't know what will. I feel this track's ranking has a limited shelf life due to the discovery of an exploit that somehow turns this into a 19 second lap. The moment that exploit becomes widely known, Red Giant is going to tumble down the list and join its brother Asteroids and fellow shortcut enthusiasts stack at the bottom. Until then, let's enjoy the ride here, because it is a compelling one. Things start with a roller coaster of a straight, swinging wildly up and down, and the moment it straightens out, you're given a brief glimpse of the first corner before the nose of your ship ends up in it. After navigating this, you get another brief tumble downhill before being thrust into the most demanding sequence of corners on the track. MS isn't the meta here, so if you want to go fast, you get to experience the full challenge these corners can offer, something I very much enjoy. Taking the final corner cleanly is paramount since it very quickly opens up into a straight, with the boost pad making clear of what your intentions could be. Part of the learning process of this next section is foregoing the track altogether and cutting as straight a line as possible towards the next part, so this means you get a few seconds of 0G piloting. It's trickier than it looks, believe you me. Pitching too far up or down will cause you to either miss track sections when you need to, or rejoin them when you don't. 
After a brief jump, we're presented with our final streak and the thing Red Giant is best known for, the satellites. These pendulous buggers are most deliberately placed in front of the teleporter that loops you back to the start, so you will have to carefully judge your approach, in theory. When it comes to time trials at least, you can all but guarantee they never become an obstacle so long as you put out roughly 35 to 37 second laps. In races however, it's a bit less clear cut. Sure, you could just wait for a second to see if the way is clear, but optimally you're boosting before you even have time to check that. It's a bit all or nothing, a bit random. Good for surprise upsets, less so for actual racing. It's one of the things that inhibits Red Giant from achieving true greatness. What else stops it from getting there? The teleporter at the end of the lap. It has the occasional habit of just ignoring any ship trying to pass through it, but the kill plane behind it has no such misgivings. I sure hope you weren't on a good lap there, sport. When Red Giant deigns to play nice, it's a track of constant thrills, which makes the moments where it stops being nice all the more jarring. I've been trying my best to emphasise how much first impressions matter, because, well it's a basic fact of life that we're judgmental creatures. We make an impression of someone or something within seconds. Kalima then has the unenviable task of being the first impression, the track all Red Out pilots start on, whether it's in the full game or the demo. For me, it was the latter, prompted by a chance encounter on Steam's discovery queue. I've grown up with racing games, but by the late 2010s, the arcade racer had fallen out of favour with the gaming landscape at large, and by extension, me. That all changed as soon as I started to do time trials in Cairo. The cobwebs were blasted away, and I was immediately reminded of what I'd been missing out on. Everything that's good in Red Out is good here. The music, the visuals, the speed, and at least for the time, the challenge. Actually, no, that's misleading, for Kalima is a challenge at all levels of play, it's just that what constitutes a challenge changes drastically as a player's skill progresses. At first, it might be the sandstorm obscuring your vision, or it could be the harshness of that first turn. Whatever it is, Kalima's endgame takes the community's tried and true adage of strafe more, steer less to its logical extreme, and becomes one of if not the biggest test of optimization in the game. Such is the nature of a racing game's first track, I suppose. It has the most exposure, and thus the most amount of people playing it to death. Even despite all of that, it's not the most interesting of tracks, but what do you expect? It's an introduction, and I'm sure it'd have scared off even more players than it has done already if it was more like spinning pipe. Instead, I will thank Kalima for playing its part in fostering the love I have for Red Out, its vision and concepts, and providing an enduring test of skill. Vishnu's appeal is pretty obvious to anyone who's flown in this track before, but just in case you're wondering, The feeling of speed is something that Red Out gets right, which makes it all the more impressive that Vishnu's party piece feels more visceral than just about anything else you can encounter. Jumping between two planetoids is also a truly unique feature of the entire roster, and is absolutely Party Rock's ace in the hole. Yet despite starting off on its best foot, Vishnu trips and falls the moment you… well, the moment you land, funnily enough. After lambasting escape velocity for its corners, I'm going to sound like a massive hypocrite when I criticise Vishnu for trying to add substance to its own. Half of the lap is spent on this neighbouring planetoid and dealing with its thin, snaky road and sharp bends. Now don't get me wrong, the attempt to add some complexity is appreciated, it really is, but some of these corners are just infuriating. They're also relentless, so while most of them are pretty fun, the ones that aren't are so interwoven with the others that it brings the whole package down by quite a bit. I think this chicane here might be the worst defender for it. Why is it here? Why was this necessary? 
After the corners you'll have just dragged your ship out of, this will test your patience like its walls will test your hull. Mercifully, things pick up again afterwards. We've got to get back to Party Rock proper, so whenever we'll flat out section follows with absolutely no niggling interruptions whatsoever. Again! Who's putting these fucking chicanes here? Mastering to take this cleanly is like trying to learn how to breathe water by being waterboarded. It's the parting shot of irritations from this track, thankfully for both its sake and mine. From here the track opens up again, all the way to the finish, and the focus shifts from heavy steering to precise ship angling and strafing your heart out. The affectionately named Space Cannon does a lot of the carrying here. Both of the major jumps here are wonderful too, both visually and mechanically. Even the parts that I don't like, I must concede, add to the identity of Vishnu as a staggeringly large, difficult and over the top track, but that also makes it a track that's hard to spend much time on, let alone love. From one hyper fast track to another. Welcome to Hydro Thunder. I might go out on a limb here and say this is the least complicated track in Europa, but that's not saying much when it's brushing shoulders with the likes of Spinning Pipe and Surface Sprint. Perhaps I feel this way because it stretches its difficulty out over a minute, whereas its companions just scrape past being 30 seconds long. Rest assured though, Hydro Thunder is still a tricky customer, even with its protracted first straight. Small wonder why it clocks in at around a minute, huh? Once you've had your fun with going fast, Hydro Thunder demands you earn the right to do it again by throwing, oh no, corners at you. Compared to another hyper fast track like Escape Velocity, the corners here aren't superficial, nor do they strip you of all your speed. The technical sections are numerous and demanding in their quantity, but are sprinkled evenly across the track so that they don't become a source of aggravation, unlike Vishnu. I'm actually struggling to think of any section that really bothers me. I guess this little sequence near the end? It's always felt a bit clumsy no matter how you approach it. Feels a bit lost at sea compared to the rest of the track. The real showstopper of Hydro Thunder isn't its straights or its corners, but actually the final jump at the end. Hurtling down towards the seabed, you can just barely make out the contrast in red of the track and not much else but the depth of it at least allows you plenty of time to think how you're going to handle the landing and the final corner. Here's a tip, they're basically the same thing. After the corners preceding it, being able to just nullify this one and blaze a trail to the finish is so satisfying and so freeing. Hydro Thunder gives you a taste of true speed, but never lets you get sick of it. You could even say that this track ebbs and flows like the tides themselves. Now isn't that just thematic? God, Vauxhall is such a simple track that I'm not sure how to approach it. Like, explaining its appeal feels almost patronising, you know? But I suppose, with the impunity with which I've shot on other players' favourite tracks, I should feel no reservations about explaining the ones I like, especially this far up the order. So here we go then. Vauxhall is short, fast, simple. The former two are the things that negatively affect the Sarah the most. Short tracks of boost patterns are extremely demanding for a ship with an energy pool big enough to power a small town for a year, even with the power up that improves recharge time. Speed is something that doesn't come to a Sarah very well, so consequently it doesn't lend itself well to the tracks that require it the most. I, however, am a stubborn little arsehole, and I love fighting against the odds. So in this regard, the door to Vauxhall's already been opened to me. A lap of Vauxhall will see you go through four corners. Four. There's more if you decide not to take the cut, but you know, why would you not take the cut? This is another example of a cut improving a track. Instead of having to slow down for this S section, you get to fling yourself into the polygonal sky and ignore it completely. Obviously, this is the highlight for me, but a close second is the first corner. I have to boost in the middle of it because, again, Acera's recharge speed sucks and it transforms a simple left-hander into a manic scramble that'll dictate the entire lap. 
Where Trench is a track you need to be absolutely wired to play, Voxel is one you can unplug your brain from and enjoy. Ironic, considering this is the one inside a simulation program. That said, the canonical reason for Vertex's existence is to train pilots, so simplistic design should be expected here. And unlike Return Null, Voxel makes no illusions about what it's trying to be, and that earnestness wins big points from me. Next to Explorer, Glowing Caves might be one of the tracks I have the most lap logged on. I wonder if Red Out 2 will track that as a stat, that would be pretty cool. Then again, I don't think I want to know how much time I've spent in some of these tracks. Glowing Caves is the first, and frankly best track of Sequoia. It feels like it's iterated on the features of the other four tracks and got the ratios just right. Speed, technicality, the visuals, the mu- Okay, not the last one, but you know, still pretty good. Back when I hardcore grinded this track, and please don't take that out of context, I affectionately renamed this Glowing Chicanes, because if you get all three of them right, you yourself will be glowing. One year later, and I maintain that assessment. Sure, there are other obstacles to overcome here, but the bottleneck are those chicanes. I'm talking about chicanes a lot in this part. I think they're taking over. The insidious will of Durga King is far reaching. Soon there will be no straight roads left in the world. Only an endless chain of zigzagging corners and strategically placed fast food joints that you won't see until it's too late and you'll be forced to buy their products. Uh, uh, why do I smell burnt toast? Anyway, uh, those chicanes. Chicanes are good, yes? Yes. That's why Glowing Caves is good, yes? It has so many of them. The, the first one seems fairly innocuous, just at the start, but it becomes a much different beast when hot lapping in class 4, particularly on a Sarah. My favourite feature of the ship becomes my undoing here. A few corners later, and we're diving down into the titular glowing caves at breakneck speeds. The vibe in here is so good, with the fluorescent mushrooms, cave paintings, and shimmering reflections bouncing off the low poly walls. Also, chicanes. The second one is quickly found, and it's definitely the easiest, but with the embankments on each part of it, it tickles me pink to just sashay through it before going further into the cave at full tilt. Along this straight section is where the third chicane chooses to strike, and it's almost as hard as the first one. You don't get to see it either, so have fun with that trial and error. The time difference between a clean third chicane and even a slightly suboptimal one can be as much as two tenths, so if the first chicane didn't kill your hot lap, then this will. From here though, it's smooth sailing. As smooth sailing as a Sequoia track can be anyway. Bursting out of the cave from behind the waterfall is a cliché, but it's a cliché for a good reason. It's bloody good fun. One more hairpin and a very crooked start finish straight is all that stops you from reaching the goal from here. Glowing Caves is deceptive. It looks like a fairly middle of the road track at first, but as I spent more and more time in it I began to appreciate the technical depth it has. The places where you can lose time are far too many to count, and they're each as severe as each other. Learning how to avoid those pitfalls, and then using that knowledge to execute a clean lap, is extremely gratifying. It's a microcosm of my experience on any Red Out track, granted, but Glowing Caves in particular is one of the sweetest experiences I've had. I played a lot of World of Warcraft back in the day, so when I saw the flyby for this track, as you are now, the first thought that entered my head was, oh, this is Nagrand. Just like that place, Floating Falls winds up being a serene place to be, which is quite the statement to be making about any track in this game. It would be to its detriment even, were it not for the fact Floating Falls has a few bumps in its wide, fast roads to keep pilots on edge. The first bump is literal and probably an understatement at that. You have this steep crest to go over, and it cheekily lacks barriers on one side, the side you're most likely to stray towards when you boost over and down the hill. Another classic exercise in muscle memory, though the corners that succeed it are telegraphed well in advance thanks to the openness of the scenery, and gives you plenty of time to figure out how to deal with them. 
Later on we get this massive continuous right turn that feels like it's Ape and Shiva, except it's not got that steep elevation. Then again, I think this is far better, particularly when you're faced with the exit. A twist in the road means drawing a straight line through it requires some finesse, but once you're free of that, you're also free of the track for a second or two. You could rejoin immediately, but as usual, the fastest way to go is to cut it as much as possible without getting acquainted with the kill plane on the other side. Once you've gotten that down though, the best part of the entire track awaits you. As soon as you wall bounce, you're hitting the turbo. Where to go initially is telegraphed by the boost pad, but there's a second immediately after the jump. The awkward angle results in one of the rare instances where you pitch downwards, but as soon as you hit that second boost pad, you've got to level out, follow the road around and then cut the corner through the next jump as much as possible without also coming into contact with the floating rocks on the inside. All with as minimal steering input as possible. Then Floating Falls breaks out a spiral turn just to completely dunk on Shiva before the finish line. It's smaller in scale, yet manages to realise what it could have been back in Party Rock. You want to slide in at a gentle angle so you can go in as deep into the corner as you can with minimal speed loss, then tighten your line to cling to the inside until you can see the exit of the corner, and then launch right out of it. I really enjoy it. All in all, this is a cosy track, a detox from Redout's harsher and more difficult offerings, but when you're on the boil there's plenty enough here to keep it stimulating. The biggest thing I can throw against this track is, ironically, its speed, as it fates the leaderboards here to be rolled over by Soul Ha. Anything less just won't do when you're shooting for the top, but since that speaks for a lot of the tracks in this list, that can only be a minor criticism. A lot of people call this track boring, but as you can imagine, I disagree. If you're ever feeling burnt out from whatever goal you're trying to achieve in Red Out, then I recommend spending a few laps cruising around here to realign yourself. Hi there, can't talk, Red Out 2 is in 3 weeks and I need to get 2 more videos out. Here's the list as it stands, here's where you go to disagree with me, down below the video is the button you press to let me know this is the kind of thing you want to see more of, ok? Ok, great. Uh, thank you for watching and I'll be seeing you very soon.